Thank you. Good morning. Glad to see everybody out. Uh, we invite our visitors back every opportunity you have. Come study with us. I don't have a PowerPoint today, so I got one made, but uh, I went to go on OneDrive and it wouldn't let me cross back over to download it on my flash drive, so I'll, I'll scratch my head and try to figure out how to do that. So. But it's good to see everybody out this morning, and uh, we need the rain. That's one thing we're getting. That's good. I want to say something about uh, James 1, 26, and 1, 20, chapter, verses 26 and 27. Things are not always as they seem. What do you mean by that? Well, I looked it up, and... Things aren't always what they seem. It's a phrase that can refer to an idea that our appearances can be deceiving or that our reaction to something may not be entirely related to the moment. We talk about fireflies. You see the little things that light up at night. And we call them flies, but they're not. They're beetles. They're silkworms. They're caterpillars. They're not worms. Lead pencils were made of graphite, not lead. And there are others, English horns are French, alto oboes. <laughs> so there's different things that we can see and, and do within our lives. And if you ever watch TV shows uh, like Madlock and uh, Perry Mason and some of the others, they always come up with a clue where they can uh, track down the killer. And you sit there and through those shows or those movies, you think you got it all figured out and then there's cute things that they throw in uh, and you realize, well, what a scene. It looked like that individual was guilty, but it wasn't. It was maybe somebody else. And that's something we got to, to realize. There's all things that happens within our lives that are always as they seem. If we read, as read in James 1, verses 26 and 27, James tells us that a Christian with an uncontrolled tongue is not pleasing before God, and he's not. Yet, we like to think that the Lord won't care if I use a certain euphemism in place of those words from time to time. Likewise, real religious conduct is deserved by those Christians who care for widows and orphans. How many Christians do you see doing that? So we're in a bind here, aren't we? We, we claim that we're Christians, but if we're not taking care of the widows and the orphans, according to James, we're not religious. We're not righteous before God. And that's something that and we'll, we'll look at later on in this uh, study. Uh, turn to uh, Genesis, the third chapter, verse 6. Eve was the first one to learn that things are not as they seem. Here she is. She's in the Garden of Eden. And she thought this plant or this uh, fruit was very beautiful. It is a tree of knowledge. And it can make a person wise. And Eve thought, well, you know, I like to have some knowledge. And this fruit is very precious and, and so beautiful, kind of hard not to, to take a bite of. And it comes to that fact that she took a bite of that fruit and gave it to her husband. In Genesis 3 and 6, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. How many times have we seen something that is pleasing before our eyes, and we finally take part of it and realize it's not what we expect it to be? Not what it is seen. And that's something that maybe we would have thought the same thing as Eve did, seeing that precious fruit hanging there and thinking, boy, that really looks good. I wonder what it tastes like. 
I think I always used an example of Banner when they got rid of steam-driven uh, power down there and went electric. And they always told us not to touch this one button because they would never get the, start, the machine to start up again, ever. And we stood there and we looked at it, and it's tempting, this nice red button there on these computers. And we kept thinking, oh, what would happen if I pushed that button? Would it shut down like they say? Would it not ever start again? Which would make some of us happy. <laughs> but at that time, we, we thought about it. And if we knew that the plant was going to shut down, I would have loved that, had that last day with my job go. Bing, and see what happens. But we get tempted. And we got things that it's not always what it seems to be at times. Had an individual come in down there that uh, supposed to be an expert on the on the steam power that we had, and he tore it apart, fixed it up, and cleaned it up, and all this thing. Well, he left a washer out, and this uh, one uh, maintenance man kept that washer in his pocket after he seen it laying there, and they couldn't control the speed of the the steam power. Uh, motor that was ran by steam, it kept taking off and ready to drip, blow everything up right down there at Banner if it wouldn't shut down. He spent two weeks on it. Two weeks. And we was out of work for those two weeks waiting for him. I could go in try to help start it up. And that one maintenance man says, here, you need this. Oh, Washington ain't going to make a difference. Get out of here. You know what you're talking about. Well, guess what? He finally got upset with the individual, and he took that washer and put it in where he was told to put it in. That motor ran great. He took that one washer. Didn't seem important. Things not always what they seem to be. How, how can a washer make that big a difference? but it did. And sometimes we do the same thing within our daily lives and we got to, to realize that we're sometimes like Eve. We see something, we look precious to us and we try to take a bite of it. Yet what it brought was a life of hardship and pain and childbearing. In Genesis the third chapter, verses 16 through 19, and to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow, thy thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And to Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened to the voice of the wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles, shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou, thou return to the ground. For out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and to dust shalt thou return. Because of her taking of that fruit, it brought on misery upon mankind, brought on sin, and Mankind could now work hard for what he gets. Once in a while, we, we get out there on Eric's farm and we're picking those black raspberries and, and we, we once in a while we say, thanks, Eve and Adam, because I'm getting pricked and, and stuck with the thorns and everything and trying to dig into the plant so I can get the black raspberries or, or Jim and and we'll just get practically eaten up by, by the thorns, no matter what you wear. And uh, the fact is that we are working a little bit harder. We're down there sweating. But this was all brought on because of Eve and Adam at that time. Even though it looked precious, even looked good, but it brought on a lot of misery. And that's something that we sometimes get involved in our lives. We see something that is precious. 
but we partake of it, and then we find out it brings a lot of pain and misery within our lives. Some big people are hooked on drugs and, and alcohol, and they think, well, it's good. It, it looks good. It's precious. Look how them people are on TV. They make it really look precious, don't they? Very good. Fun. Partying. And then they get involved in that stuff and then find out it brings a lot of misery in their life. I always got to kick out these truck uh, advertisements as I'm thinking about not always as it seems. And they're pulling all this heavy equipment in their pickup truck, brand new. And, and you ever read the bottom part? Do not try at home. Do not try this or do this with your truck that you buy. Why? You're telling me it can do all these things. And I need it for my job or whatever. It looks good. But guess what? If you try to do some of the things they were doing with their trucks on that commercial, you may lose a transmission or, or blow up the motor or, or something on that order. Yeah, it looked good. But there's a problem that comes with it. Solomon points out that many things in life are vain. Turn over to Ecclesiastes, the first chapter, verses 17 and 18. Ecclesiastes 1, beginning with verse 17. I gave my heart to know wisdom, to know madness and folly. I perceived that, th that this also is the vexation of spirit. For in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increases knowledge increases sorrow. Does that sound right? Solomon says, I need knowledge. I need wisdom. I need to know it. But at the same time, it brought forth with, uh, sorrow in Ecclesiastes as he's talking here. What's he mean by this? But well, the problem is, Solomon affirms that in much wisdom is much grief, and he increases knowledge, increases sorrow. However, however, Proverbs asserts that happiness is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding, Proverbs 3, verse 13. Now, does wisdom bring forth sorrow or happiness? Which is it? It all depends on the purpose for which the wisdom and the knowledge are sought. In Ecclesiastes, Solomon was seeking wisdom under the sun, chapter 1, verse 3. That is apart from God, as a source of happiness. This is he rightly concludes that vanity and grasping for the wind, in verse 14 of chapter 1. However, if wisdom is based, is viewed as based in the fear of the Lord and Proverbs 1 7, then it very means of attaining true happiness. In other words, we're seeking the wisdom of mankind. We're seeking wisdom from this earth, worldly things. This, it does bring forth sorrow. But when we use that wisdom and that knowledge that has been given to us by God, and we seek it for doing His will, it does bring forth happiness to us. Solomon came to that conclusion in Ecclesiastes 12, and verse 13. The whole command thing is fear God and keep his commandments. That's everything we need. Fear God and keep it. Everything else upon this earth is vanity. We work ourselves to death at times. I'm not saying we shouldn't work. I'm just saying that these things can't take us with it, with us, with us when we die. It's done. Somebody else is going to get used to that property or that house or that farm or, or your vehicle or, or ever. Somebody else will use it until they die, and then it passes on until the judgment day. It's vanity. Sometimes we, we kill ourselves at our work trying to get all these material things and it don't benefit us any, really much 
within this life. There's a little bit of enjoyment. But what about life eternal? God has given us something that is better than any physical thing that we can have upon the face of this earth. In Proverbs, the third chapter, verses 8, 13 through 18, Happy is a man that findeth wisdom, and he that getteth understanding. For the merchandise is of better; it is better than the merchandise of silver, the gain thereof than fine gold. It is she is more precious than rubies? All the things that thou canst desire are not to be compared to her. Left for days in her right hand, in her left hand riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness. All her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her. Happy is everyone that retaineth her. All the wisdom that we need to have upon this earth as we live in our wisdom that power of God has given to us that we can receive heaven as our home. It's nice to have a few things. We need to produce a living. Don't get me wrong. But the fact is, sometimes we strive for something we don't really truly need in this life, and it takes us away from doing God's will. Do God's will, and you got something that is more precious than the gold and silver that is that we can get on this planet. Well, I, I hear people, and my, my son says, I'm thinking about converting over to gold. I said, why? I know you, you, you're looking for the future, but the future is heaven. Our future is spiritual. That's the one we need to be striving for. That's the one we need to be working for at all times. That's the one that we need to have when the judgment day comes or the fact that we die before Christ comes back. We have heaven as our home. And we can only do that by getting the knowledge and wisdom that God has given to us. And that's what Solomon is trying to get across to us. All these things are bad to you. You work, but how long do you get to enjoy it? Always heard about the golden years. You ever hear that? You young people, you hear about the golden years? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I couldn't wait for them golden years to get to retire and get to travel and, and get to do all these things. Well, I'm at the golden years. It's no fun. It's not. Got aches and pains. You're broke. You're, you're trying to make ends meet at times, and you can't do the things you had planned. And some of the ones that you were friends with and, and loved throughout the life as you grown up died. No longer around that you can talk to or visit with. Yeah, golden years, huh? I always told talk, talk somebody, I'd like to find out who started that because I want to call him a liar. So I want to see what he thought about it when he got there. <laughs> but think about it. We hear these things, but they're not always what they seem to be. We, we hear these things, and we grasp a hold of them, and we think, yes, I can't wait. But at the same time, Turn out to be a dud sometimes, <laughs> as, as we would say. Yeah, wisdom of God. James 1, verse 5. If, you lack any, if, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. We need to be praying for wisdom. We need to be praying for knowledge. We need to be praying for, for the things we need to know to, to be able to live on this earth and prepare ourselves for heaven. Likewise, in uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, beginning at verse 17, Therefore, if I hated life, because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me, for all is vanity and vexation of the spirit. Yea, I hated all my labor, 
which I have taken under the sun, because I shall leave it unto the man that shall be after me. And who knoweth whether he shall be wise or a fool, yet shall he, shall he have rule over all my labor, wherein I have labored, wherein I have showed myself wise under the sun. This is also vanity. Think about it. I'm not trying to down everybody and depress you at this time. But the fact is, as Solomon brought out in Ecclesiastics, this was what happened. We may work, build our home, and make it really super nice, and by the time we get a chance to enjoy it, we pass on or something happens, we got to sell. And then we get upset because somebody else that took over after we done the work on it start changing things. Because it wasn't what they seemed to be, according to them. Think about it. I, I, I got a kick out of tool time when his mother was getting ready to move out of their house. And they, him and his brothers were getting ready to move her. And the first thing people started saying, well, we're going to tear this stairway out. We're going to do changes here. We're going to change the floor. Uh, we got to do something about these walls. And he got super upset because all the work that they put into that house for her, it's all done. It's vanity. They're going to tear it out and rip it apart and replace it. And sometimes we forget to realize that sometimes the property we own, the, the farms or, or whatever, yeah, we enjoy it. But the next person, what's going to happen to it? How are they going to take care of it? And we get upset about it. But there's nothing we can do. Ecclesiastes 3 and 9 says, What profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? I can't take it with me. I can't do anything about it. I can't come back and, and, and haunt them until they get back to the way I had it. These things are, are, are useless. They, they, they deteriorate. They destroy at the judgment day. Everything around about us. Oh, yeah, I got a nice car. I, I spent uh, $30,000, $40,000 for my sports car that I got. And you know what? It's going to rust just about as fast as my car out there. You know that? It's going to break down just like my car out there. I grew up and dad went to a barber. And he had a Corvette. And my dad asked me, he says, I want to see your Corvette. I was in the shop. So we go back a month later, and where's your Corvette? Well, I had to put it back in the shop. And here he is. He, he bought this nice Corvette. And it was a nice-looking car at that time. But it spent more time in the shop than he did driving it. What good was it? It was all vanity. He spent all that money for a nice-looking car that he couldn't drive 90% of the time. Think about it. Also talk about our work. Increase the Acts 6, 5, and, uh, t beginning in verse 10 and 11. He that loveth silver, silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundant with increase this is also vanity. When goods increase, they are increased that eat them. And what good is there to the owners thereof, saving the beholding of them with their eyes? Yes. I'm going to have myself a nice home in my golden years, and I'm going to relax. And next thing I know, I'm putting more repairs into it. Or I may have to end up selling it to somebody that they can no longer afford it. And or we see something, you know what? I kind of like that house down the street a little bit better than I'd like mine. So I'll, I'll sell mine 
buy that one. And we keep increasing. We keep wanting more. Think about TV sets. When I was growing up, a little 19 inch TV, black and white, and Dad finally seen the first color TV come out at Montgomery Wards. Well, that's a long time. Montgomery Wards and his console had the stereo, the radio station, you know, radio on one side, the record player on the other side, the color TV in the middle. And it took about six guys to pick up this console to bring it in the house. This thing was so heavy. Got to have it. Got to have it. Got to. We're improving. We get that TV set, hook up the antenna, because there's no cable at that time. You stand outside, and one leg, and you stand there and, and twist the, the antenna around, trying to get it to get stations in. You still only get three stations, no matter what. ABC, CBS, and NBC at the time. Once in a while, if the wind blew right, you might get WPHGH up in Pittsburgh. That wasn't very often. Now you look at it, walk in the stores, you got 23 inch, you got 47 inch, you got 64 inch. Now they got a 200 inch TV that you can buy for your house. I looked at the walls in the house and I was like, there ain't a wall big enough so I can put a 200 inch TV <laughs> up on the wall. And you can't buy a cabinet. I mean, they've got to be super long too. Just put it on. But you got people who are standing there and will do anything they can. Hey, come over to my house. I see the 200 inch TV I got. I'm thinking about, I heard I got a thousand. I'm thinking about buying one of them. Really? We want more. We keep asking for more. And we keep wanting desire. But these days, not what they seem to be. Twenty-three inch or forty inch TV just works just as good as that two thousand inch TV, and you don't have to figure out how to carry it or move it around or whatever. You enjoy it in computers or telephone, the cell phones. Every time they come out for a new cell phone, what's the first thing people do? You see a big line at the, the phone store. And they go around two or three blocks. People all want them to buy that $1,000 cell phone. That works just as good as my $49 cell phone. <laughs> and what do you need it for? To call? Maybe text somebody once in a while. But they put all these things on these phones. Some of the people don't know how to work it. They don't know what good it is. You got so much gadgets on it. And the same way with automobiles, they got so much on it that we can't figure out how to run the car sometimes. It's a waste. It's foolishness. It just rot like Everything else will. 1 Corinthians, first chapter, beginning of verse 18. Wisdom of this world is foolishness. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and, bring, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after the, that in the, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews required a sign the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness. But unto them that are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God, the wisdom of God, became the foolishness of God, 
is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Mankind always thought themselves as being smart and wise. But you ever notice they always change their so-called wisdom? Talk about what type of foods we ought to eat, what's good and what's bad. Then a few years down the road, you don't touch this. It's bad for you, but eat this. Then down the years, a few years down the road, don't eat that. I just told you, you ate, you know, to eat 10 years ago. Don't eat that anymore. Eat this. It's better for you. I don't know how many times I heard the breakfast being changed throughout gro growing up and uh, what's good to eat for breakfast, what not. Or to eat breakfast. Uh, at times they told you not to eat breakfast. You know, it's bad for you. Now they're back to eating breakfast. And it's good for you, but don't eat cereal. You eat this or something else. Uh, don't eat fast food. It'll ruin you. I mean, it's it, all man's wisdom it keeps changing all the time. And there are other things that throughout our lives has been changed so many times. Oh, uh, we found that was a mistake. We should have never have done that. You ever hear somebody tell you that, a doctor? Well, we had surgery. Uh, yeah, at that time, it was, it was the proper thing to do. But now we realize, not so good. We should have left it in there. <laughs> really? But that's man's wisdom. They keep changing things. And that's what Paul was trying to tell the church of Corinth. This wisdom that man strives for of this world, it's not worth it. But the wisdom and knowledge that God gives us is. And that's the wisdom and things that we need to, to strive for. The fact that eternal salvation can only be achieved through God's will. Doing his word. Worldly wisdom teaches that religion is a waste of time, even detrimental to education. You hear that? See the problems we got now in our world? Not only in this country, but all over. Because they all fell for that line. Oh, it's not what it always seems to be. Developing patience through trials. I talked to somebody one time, and, and uh, we talked about praying for trials so we can learn patience. And when we start talking to that individual about what you go through to deserve patience and, and earn it and, and work for it and to receive it, I don't know if I want to pray for that. Really? First Peter, the third chapter. Excuse me. Got the head of myself here. Developing patience. James, uh, verse, uh, chapter one, verses two and three. Excuse me. Getting ahead of myself here. My brother, count it all joy when you fall into dire temptation. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven. Excuse me. Okay. Knowing this, that the trial of your faith worketh patience. Excuse me. My fault again. Fact is, when we talk about earning patience, you got to go through trials and tribulations. I don't know if I really want to do that. Paul talked about it. James talked about it. We need to try and, and earn patience. But the only way to receive patience is going through trials and tribulations within our lives. And sometimes we get to the point, well, I don't want, I don't want to go through all that to preserve patience. 
One thing that will give you patience is raising kids. They can drive you up the wall sometimes, especially when they get to the teenage years and they get to be a handful. Patience. You got to have patience to work with them. Then there are others that we go through, maybe sickness that we have, some type of ailment we have. You learn patience. It's hard. It is. The fact that we need to stand back and, and, and try to, to rely upon God and, and keep praying to him to have, have us overcome these ailments or these problems we have in our daily lives takes time. It takes patience. we got to learn through God's word what we need to be doing, how we need to be earning that patience and, and, and figuring out how we can help somebody else get through those problems too in our lives. Yeah, it's a handful. But we must do such. We must strive for that patience. We've got to, to learn to sometimes keep our mouth shut uh, before we stick our food in, foot in them, in our, our mouth. we got to, you know, maybe quit hearing some things. Well, I shouldn't, I shouldn't, I shouldn't get involved in gossip. I shouldn't be saying things I should, uh, shouldn't be saying. i got to, got to be like the three little monkeys you see. Quit close your ears and your mouth and sometimes close your eyes. Patience. Sometimes our problems that we go through our lives where maybe fighting cancer or some other disease, leukemia or, or such, and we see a little child going through that, we got to have patience with them. We got to have patience with those that may have been through a car accident and are trying to heal up, and they get a little touchy. They get aggravated at times because they want up, they want to get around, and you got to work with them and tell them, "Can't, not yet. Be patient. It's coming." Or we may be a farmer, plants things in the ground. You got to be patient when it comes up. I know it's been dry this year, but there are times when, when you plant stuff, you can't wait for it to see it growing. I want to see it. I hope I want, I, I want to pick it as soon as I can. What happens? Sometimes we get impatient. Sometimes we, we, we lose it and we maybe destroy what we had planted and, and and take and, and fill it in the ground or, or whatever we want to do with it. Sometimes we get impatient uh, with our sickness. We try to push ourselves, uh, and we all do that to some degree. And I, I do it. I, I admit to it. I push myself. Yeah, I need to take it easy. No, I got this to do, and it's going to get done. And we sometimes have to learn to be patient wherever it is. I always thought, think about Granny on uh, Beverly Hill Bill. She had the cure for the common cold. And the doctor out in Beverly Hills wanted the formula for it. And she turned around and gave it to him. She says, now you take this for seven days and your cold will go away. Well, that's a normal time for a cold to be around, seven days. And the doctor went like that. And, and he walked away from Granny. And she, she couldn't understand that that was a normal time for a cold supposedly to go away. That one individual said he was healed by somebody and said it would be six weeks before he'd get that broken bone taken care of. That's what the the hero told him, I looked at him and went, really? Six weeks? 
My doctor tells me the same thing. What? It takes six weeks for a bone to heal up most of the time. Okay? I didn't know that. Well, your faith healer didn't heal you. <laughs> if he healed you, you've been walking right now. I couldn't wait to get my eyes taken care of from the cataracts. I get me impatient because I get to the point where most of us will know it's getting hard to see. And I couldn't see a sign up in Pittsburgh to save my life until I was straight underneath it and I had to look up and hurry up and try to change lanes because I didn't know where I was going. That's when she was in the hospital. So I had to take a boy with me one of them, to say, Dad, you need two, two lanes over, quick. <laughs> I couldn't wait to get it done. They said they had to be ripened. You know how desperate I was to try to get those things out or off so that I could see? And when I had them finally taken out or removed or whatever, it was great. But boy, did I get impatient a little bit. I'm getting frustrated. Can't see at night. Can't do this. Can't do that. Can't read the fine print going across the TV. And it wasn't really fine print with big letters like that. <laughs> but the thing is, we got to learn patience. And finally, food doesn't sustain life. John, the sixth chapter verses 26 and 27. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me, not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye ate the loaves, did eat of the loaves, and were filled. They were not for the meat which perisheth, for that, but for that meat that endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Also in John, the sixth chapter, verse 35, Jesus said unto, him, unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. We talk about food in our everyday diet. We've got to have it. It sustains our physical body, but it doesn't do a thing for our spiritual body, our soul. And God and Christ is telling us that we need to accept the bread that he has given to us. He is the living bread. Any man that eats of it shall live forever. That's what we need to be striving for. That's the bread, that's the food that we need to be nourishing on at this time. Christ sacrificed himself upon the cross, our obedience and reverence to him. And feeding the word of God, which is what it is essential to our eternal life. He died and went through these things so we can remember him and do his will. That we can have heaven as our home. Have our sins forgiven. The fact that we are to strive for those things. And forget about food upon this earthly planet. That we have. I'm saying not to eat. But the fact is, sometimes we put more emphasis on that than we do spiritual food that we need to be partaking of. One last thing it does not seem to be as it seems the act of baptism. It saves us from our sins. 1 Peter 3 21, Acts 22, and verse 16. And to the world, it seems like a ritual that has no purpose. Yet it is actually a response of a good conscience towards God in obedience to his commandment, Mark 16, 16. To be baptized, buried with him in a watery grave, in accordance to Romans 6, chapter, verses 3 and 4, rose up as a new creature. That is a meaning. It is important to do these things if we want to get to heaven. We got to be obedient to his will. We got to obey God. Not what we like, not what we think. We got to do it his way. For we 
lose our soul. Things not always what they seem. If you want to be saved from your sins, today is a good day to do such. As we get ready to sing the invitation song at this time. <laughs>